Simon Maybaum is um, medical director of the Center for Advanced Cardiac Therapy and uh, related to the cardiac transplant and cardiac assist device program. He's associate professor of clinical medicine, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce him to talk about his work. Well, I don't know if Dr. Farley is still here, but before I started, I, I did want to register a complaint that no one from the city called me. I spend most of my time in the supermarket in a very small area of shelving which houses English chocolate. Um, <laughs> Of course, English chocolate is the only chocolate, and notwithstanding everything we've heard about um, obesity here, and no one at all called me to offer me $10,000 as an incentive to lose weight, <laughs> and I would, uh, I would invite those calls, and I would be an eager participant. <clears throat> so um, uh, it is a little bit uh, intimidating for me as primarily a clinician to come here and uh, address this symposium um, speaking after some really um, uh, notable investigators. Um, and what I would like to try and do is describe how an active clinical program um, can uh, participate in clinical research that um, yields uh, meaningful therapies for um, a really quite a needy patient population. And so the first goal, briefly, of my talk is, is wh why a thriving clinical research program is vital to the success of a heart transplant program. Um, to update you on some of the challenges for the end-stage heart failure patient in 2010. And then to um, just point out some of the novel therapies that are currently um, in clinical trials here at Montefiore. So I'd like you to meet our neighbor here. Um, this is the heart transplant program at Columbia University. Uh, the heart transplant program at Columbia University is the largest heart transplant program actually in the world. Um, and um, it was the challenge of building a heart transplant program and an advanced heart failure program um, in such a competitive environment that um, led us to the conclusion that the road forward was to build a very robust clinical trials uh, uh, program. And that that would succeed in fulfilling two of our goals. One, to um, build a large and competitive program. And the second, to improve the quality of life of our patients. So um, it's certainly... Um, it's certainly beyond the scope of this talk um, to address all of the trials that are currently taking place at the Center for Advanced Cardiac Therapy. And the purpose of showing this slide is really to illustrate um, the breadth of clinical research that we do within the confines of a busy clinical program. And um, what I wanted to show you here was that these trials in this unique integrated program exist across the surgical and the medical domain. Um, and they include industry-sponsored trials, NIH-sponsored trials, um, trials for drugs, trials for devices. Um, I highlighted here the trials in yellow in which we, um, as a group, were amongst the top three enrollers in the country. So why is that important, particularly in an industry-sponsored trial? It's important because showing prominence um, in effective um, enrollment and excellence in clinical trial practice um, attracts um, sponsors with, with prom promising new therapies to our institution um, to offer us participation in trials, and particularly trials that might not be on offer um, at the other programs in the New York metropolitan uh, area. And of course, the second big academic, <coughs> excuse me, academic gain um, is that uh, once you have uh, shown um, active involvement in a clinical trial, um, you, um, are, you, you have the license for access to the clinical trial database, which is often a very rich, um, uh, a very rich uh, um, uh, uh, treasure of secondary analysis. And actually, if I just draw your attention to the ASCEND trial, which is going to be uh, presented on Sunday at the American Heart Institution, um, that was a trial of 7,000 patients with acute decompensated heart failure, um, in the same way that diabetes um, is uh, 
rampant here in the Bronx. Uh, acute decompensated heart failure is the most common uh, DRG um, or reason for admission in the United States. And um, surprisingly, we still don't know how to take care of these patients, um, and we don't have clinical trial data that will direct us on the most effective strategies. Uh, the ASCEND trial um, will speak to that and speak to some specific issues too um, across uh, Dr. Zolti's uh, site at um, Einstein and our program here at Montefiore. We enrolled almost 200 patients in that clinical trial. Um, that will allow us to participate uh, in further investigation through this very active clinical trial database um, that will continue to yield um, information about this important subject uh, in years to come. So, um, building a robust clinical research program has really um, allowed us to grow a advanced heart failure program in a very competitive environment, and this is just um, showing the growth of the heart failure program over the past four to five years. We're now up to some 12, 1,300 patients, and it goes without saying that um, there is no heart transplant and circuitry um, assist device program without a large heart failure program. So what are the trials? the types of trials that we have here, and again, I'm going to now take you away from population-based studies that the two prior speakers discussed um, to um, smaller, smaller trials um, uh, that we conduct here within our program. We participate, um, and I alluded to the fact that we have a reputation for very successful participation in multi-center industry-sponsored trials, both for new pharmacological agents and for devices for heart failure. Um, we um, participate and lead uh, multi-center investi investigator-initiated studies where we partner with industry for support. And then, of course, um, we use our clinical research infrastructure for um, single-center investigator-initiated research um, that, uh, um, uh, that might look at some more um, uh, curious uh, therapies for, for heart failure. So let me just uh, touch quickly on who this population is that we are um, serving. Um, we particularly here at Moses in the Center for Advanced Cardiac Therapy are taking care of patients with um, severe ventricular dysfunction who have moved beyond um, uh, conventional medical therapy with beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, and those of you who are not cardiologists in the audience will be very familiar with, um, with those therapies. They have already had a defibrillator, and if they're eligible, a biventricular pacemaker, and yet they are very symptomatic with um, a poor quality of life. And we think that there are about um, a half a million patients in the United States with this stage D heart failure, refractory to medical therapy, either with symptoms on very minimal effort or actually even symptoms at rest. And um, one calculation has estimated that of that half a million patients, around 150,000 patients might be eligible for the advanced surgical therapies that, uh, that we offer here. And yet in 2009, the sobering um, data is that only 1,852 adult heart transplants were performed in the United States, um, which uh, um, fell for the first time below 2,000 uh, in 20 years. Um, briefly, I'm going to show you data from the Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation that shows um, worldwide heart transplantation in the past 30 years because it tells a very um, interesting story of heart transplantation, and here you have the first two heart transplants performed in um, South Africa and at Stanford, leading to a lot of enthusiasm for the procedure at academic medical centers, uh, soon followed by a moratorium because of terrible outcomes, which really didn't change until the mid-1980s with the advent of cyclosporin um, and um, uh, better uh, immunosuppression therapies. Um, and um, then in the um, uh, last decade, a, a real growth in, um, I'm so sorry, in the 90s, a real growth in, uh, in heart transplantation as immunosuppression evolved, patient selection evolved, and better uh, post-transplant care. Uh, but it doesn't um, take uh, close inspection to see that there has been a significant fall in the total number of heart transplants performed that has yielded um, a um, keen interest in alternatives for this uh, um, difficult patient population. And this is our reality here at Montefiore and at the other um, large um, heart failure programs. Here are our patients. They have uh, stage D advanced heart failure. They are standing there with their infusion pole, um, and that's either dibutamine or milrinone that's supporting their cardiac output, um, uh, without which they would be um, in extremis. And they're here at the heart transplant store, but the store is out of stock. Um, 
And it is, it is this uh, donor crisis that has really spurred um, uh, um, a lot of research and development into circuitry support devices. So left ventricular assist devices, or LVADs, are now uh, used in different constellations. Um, they can be used to support an individual to heart transplantation um, who is too sick to await heart transplantation. And um, with the current donor shortage, particularly in the New York area, um, a lot of our patients end up uh, being supported with a heart pump um, prior to getting a heart transplant. Um, over the past few years, these devices have now been approved for long-term therapy that we call destination therapy um, in patients who are not heart transplant candidates by virtue of age or perhaps some other systemic complication. But really where a lot of our focus is, and please forgive um, my, my, my British um, uh, culture here citing Monty Python, is, is, to, um, is to see whether these devices could potentially be used to rest and improve the myocardium with a vision to remove the heart pump without the need for heart transplantation. Um, since Harry is on the, having me on the clock here, I am not going to be able to um, tell you, um, to go into details about the evol evolution of secretary support, um, but it is important to understand that across the first second and third generation devices, we at Montefiore have been very actively involved in the clinical trials that um, led to um, uh, their approval. Uh, briefly, this is the HeartMate 1. It's a pulsatile circuitry support device. You can see, and these are not to scale, it's a large device. Interestingly, did not require anticoagulation, which is really quite unusual for a blood pump. Uh, we learned that it lasted for about a year and a half before the device uh, um, began to um, wear out because of wear and tear and was originally approved for both the bridge to transplant and destination therapy population and is essentially obsolete now over the past two years with the approval of these newer devices that collectively are called continuous flow devices. Um, these are devices that no longer reflect the physiological circulation, but continuously push blood, blood forward into the circulation, um, posing some very interesting physiological questions. So this is the HeartMate 2 device. Um, it is an axial flow device, so there's a little spinning propeller inside the housing, draining blood from the left ventricular apex um, and uh, um, ejecting it into the ascending aorta. Um, it is noiseless. Um, because it's smaller, it's associated with less inf um, infection and malfunction. Um, anticoagulation is required, and the sense is that these devices will now support an individual without requiring change for five years. Um, this device was approved uh, for bridge to transplantation in 2008. Again, we participated actively in this trial, um, and this year was approved for long-term <coughs> therapy. Um, the most recent device in clinical trials is a centrifugal pump, and here now you have an impeller that's suspended in the blood sac and magne magnetically levitated, no more touching parts, which um, lead us to think, and certainly from bench testing suggests, that this pump may, may now last 10 years. Um, again, small enough to be um, implanted in the intrapericardial sac, no longer under the diaphragm, associated with less infection um, and uh, malfunction. And in two days' time, we will learn whether this device is going to enter clinical use as a result of the bridge to transplant um, a study presented at the American Heart Association. Um, we are proud that Montefiore was, I believe, the second patient in the country to enroll um, a patient in the destination therapy trial using this novel uh, therapy. And these are our LVAD heroes, and they really are heroes. Um, this is the dramatic change in life that a heart pump can offer a patient with advanced cardiac disease. These individuals who previously, before the circulatory support era, would be intensive care bound on multiple drips, and their only hope for survival would be a heart transplant if and when it should come, and if it came before they were too sick to benefit from it. And these individuals leave the hospital, return to work, return to active lives. This gentleman here is a nurse working at a New York hospital. Um, this gentleman here has been nominated for the New Jersey Supreme Court. If you met these people at a restaurant or in the movie theater, you would not know they were supported with a heart pump. They are completely silent and, for the most part, unobtrusive. This is again the HeartMate 2 device, and I alluded to the fact that there is some really unusual physiology going on here because no longer is the um, blood being pushed out periodically, but it is continuously flowing, 
Again, the drainage of the um, left ventricle. Um, this is the heart meet two housing, the outflow and the ascending aorta. And um, um, let me draw your attention here to this monitor, which is a patient who has uh, various um, hemodynamic monitoring, and I know that there are a few cardiologists in the room, but this is a continuous um, uh, arterial pressure tracing. And you can see that this is a very low pulsatile circuit. And in fact, um, as the patients uh, immediately recover from surgery and the heart muscle picks up some function, we do see some return of pulsatility as the heart um, uh, helps the pump, uh, blood, um, pump blood into the circulation. Um, what we are not sure of is what the long-term effects of low pulsatile circulation are on end organ function, and this is again an active area of research both here and other heart pump uh, programs, um, and I think is going to yield some very interesting um, uh, both questions and answers. But whatever the type of heart pump, there are two primary um, effects of circulatory support. Here again is that first generation pump. Um, the um, apex is, um, uh, uh, I'm so sorry, the inflow is implanted into the apex. Again, the outflow into the ascending aorta. This is a larger pump. It's implanted below the diaphragm. And um, heart pumps um, profoundly pressure and volume unload the left side of the heart, and they restore systemic blood flow and organ perfusion. Now, we were fortunate with the advent of left ventricular assist devices that um, as the surgeon puts in the heart pump, we get a core of left ventricular tissue. And that core of left ventricular tissue is essentially um, end-stage heart failure tissue. And you can imagine that as the patient goes on to heart transplantation, we then have the whole heart at the time of heart transplantation. And our basic science colleagues have told us that whether you're looking at the myocyte, the structure of the myocardium, the left ventricular chamber architecture, or even the systemic manifestations of heart failure, there is reversal of the end-stage heart failure um, uh, uh, phenotype. Um, and this was really quite remarkable since the notion previously was that um, heart failure was irreversible. By the time there was dilation and dysfunction of the heart, it was not getting better. This was termed reverse remodeling. And if I can now draw your attention to this schematic here, um, we could imagine that when there's an episode of cardiac injury, it might lead to ventricular remodeling, that is progressive enlargement of the heart and dysfunction of the heart muscle, even if the initial injury is in a, um, is in a um, focal limited place, we know that there is remote damage to the heart. Now we put a heart pump in, we know that at, certainly at the level of the uh, myocyte and the myocardium, there is um, improvement, improvement and normalization of some of the heart failure um, uh, uh, disease that we had seen previously, what we're not sure about is whether any of those changes are sufficient to um, l create meaningful functional recovery to allow the heart pump to be removed without the need for heart transplantation. And this has been an active area of debate over the last couple of years with centers in Europe um, um, reporting that a third of their patients um, with with uh, dilated cardiomyopathy can actually um, have the heart pumps taken out without the need for heart transplantation with actually much lower um, rates of recovery reported here in the United States. So this is Jessica Hardy. Um, she was um, set to join the Olympic um, uh, swim team for the Beijing Olympics and was withdrawn on the eve of the Olympics because she tested positive for a drug called clenbuterol. So clenbuterol is a beta-2 agonist um, it's available for the treatment of asthma in Europe. It is not approved in this uh, country. Um, it's more potent than albuterol because of uh, increased absorption and beta-2 selectivity. And it has potent anabolic effects and is used extensively by athletes to enhance performance. It's not a steroid. Um, Professor Magdi Yacoub, who was a preeminent heart transplant surgeon in the United Kingdom, uh, became interested in this drug um, in a now obsolete surgical procedure where one used to wrap uh, pectoral muscle around the heart to try and improve contraction. Um, and in some elegant basic science uh, work, Professor Yacoub showed that clambuterol led to myocyte hypertrophy without um, adversely affecting filling properties. In 2006, Professor Yacoub's group reported a really novel strategy um, for our advanced heart failure patients in a single center study um, in the New England Journal of Medicine where he described the combination of uh, left ventricular assist device support with medical therapy to normalize end-stage heart failure. And in um, this protocol, patients uh, without um, coronary artery disease were, who required an LVAD 
were supported with an LVAD, treated with very aggressive conventional heart failure medications, and then given clenbuterol at very high doses, in fact, 25 times the doses of clenbuterol used in asthma. Um, in this uh, small study, 15 patients completed these two phases, and two-thirds of those patients had complete reversal of the advanced uh, um, heart disease, the ability to remove the heart pump, uh, with an almost 90% four-year heart failure-free um, survival. Intriguing. Well, whenever data is too good to be true, we call for a multi-sensor clinical trial. And that's what the HARPS uh, study was. And in fact, uh, we're proud that Montefiore was a leader in that trial. Um, we are the echo core laboratory for that trial. And I'm not at liberty to share the data from that trial. It is currently being analyzed and will be presented at the upcoming uh, heart transplant meetings. But I do want to show you one patient here from Montefiore. Um, and unfortunately, um, the movies were, were consistently misbehaving. So you'll have to, um, uh, th there'll be, you have to just believe my description here. Um, is a 50-year-old patient with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy um, for several years who reached um, the stage at which she required circulatory support. Um, she had severe left ventricular dysfunction with an ejection fraction of 15% and severe left ventricular dilation. At four months, um, with the heart pump turned off, so now she's not supported by the heart pump, it's still there, we're just evaluating her heart function. After four months of clenbuterol, she had complete reversal of her heart dysfunction normal left ventricular size and function, and she went on to have the heart pump removed um, and was stable for some, um, uh, um, and has been stable for some two years with, um, without the heart pump. Intriguing. Data to be re um, reported later this year. Well, um, without blowing our own trumpet, this is really an expertise of ours here, um, uh, here, and particularly as we're now met with trying to evaluate some of these newer pumps. The first generation pumps used in the study I just described have valves. You turn them off, the blood doesn't flow back into the heart. These new devices have no valves, and you can't turn the device off because were you to do so, there would be massive regurgitation of blood back from the um, systemic circulation into the heart. And so we have described strategies in which we combine various modalities to evaluate heart reserve um, to allow us to ascertain whether an individual has now reached um, a sufficient cardiac recovery to have the heart pump removed. In our program, all patients who get a continuous flow device are treated with um, uh, aggressive heart failure medications, evaluated for recovery, and using this strategy for patients um, uh, in, in this program since the continuous flow era have had the heart pump removed um, with long stem st uh, stability avoiding the need for heart transplant. And I challenge you to tell me which of these two Jamaican twins had a heart pump and, um, and uh, recovered. And in fact, it is the lady here on the right. Um, she managed um, to return to her family and has been um, stable without recurrent heart failure on heart failure medications uh, with a normal heart function for the past um, uh, 18 months. Um, so just shifting gears, as we, um, uh, f for the last um, few slides of the talk, um, as we gained experience with clenbuterol, we asked ourselves whether strategies that athletes use um, might be helpful for our heart failure patients. Um, and what we know is that a primary aim of the management of heart failure is to improve exercise capacity. Um, and it was traditionally thought that the exercise imitation that we see in these sick patients was related to poor heart pump function. And yet, if you fix the heart pump function, you don't fix the exercise capacity. And so it is now uniformly understood that um, the lesion is not solely in the heart, but rather the skeletal muscle skeletal muscle metabolism and the vascular system that supplies the skeletal muscle becomes diseased in advanced heart failure. And so that suggested that the, the conditioning and performance enhancement strategies that athletes use might be helpful for our heart failure patients. Well, we conducted a small trial here using clenbuterol in the doses that athletes use it to see whether, in fact, that was true. And um, in this uh, small trial, we saw that uh, clenbuterol, and it's counterintuitive, of course, to use a beta agonist in a patient with advanced cardiac disease, and yet the, the FDA were convinced that it was safe, and it was, uh, and the patients um, tolerated the, um, the drug well. Um, we saw no effect of clenbuterol on LV mass, and of course we would not seek to see um, uh, um, increase in left ventricular mass in a patient who already has um, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. We did see um, uh, an improvement in lean body mass and maximal strength, 
And yet, um, in this particular strategy, we did not see an improvement in exercise uh, um, performance or endurance. Well, um, this is a list of the drugs that have been banned by the anti-doping agency. Um, and they are very rigorous about testing for these substances in competitive athletes. The one remaining performance-enhancing strategy that is still used and permitted to be used by athletes is a non-doping strategy um, in, which, in which athletes um, monopolize on the changes that occur during acclimatization to improve their performance. Um, and this is called sleep high, train low. And so athletes used to um, train at um, geographic areas of high altitude, but there are now a couple of companies in the United States that make um, environments where you can simulate altitude by stealing oxygen from the air in trap within an enclosure. And actually, um, this is a um, sealed enclosure. Um, it can either be um, fitted over a queen-size bed and an athlete will then sleep in, um, in, in the sealed enclosure with graded levels of altitude. Uh, or alternatively, someone's um, house can be, um, uh, can be adjusted to be at altitude, house or, or room, depending upon how much money you wish to spend and how successful an athlete you are. Um, and this uh, device works by uh, um, uh, stealing oxygen through a molecular sieve and then um, pumping the air into a sealed enclosure. So we asked the question, was the physiological changes during acclimatization, would they be good for heart failure? Again, counterintuitive. Who would put a patient with advanced heart failure into a low oxygen environment? Well, if you think about it, um, this is what you see with acclimatization. You see improvement in blood volumes and oxygen handling capacity of blood. Um, you see an um, increase in red blood cell mass and a shift uh, to the right of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. And one of our primary targets in heart failure is improved oxygen delivery to the periphery. Uh, and that's along with improvement in skeletal muscle function, uh, improvement in respiratory function, and even reported changes in heart function. Uh, and so um, we just reported um, some preliminary results from a pilot trial where we did just that. We put stable chronic heart failure patients in an altitude enclosure um, and exposed them to altitude training. And actually, um, our results were picked up uh, um, uh, by, by the, uh, the press. And, and just to close here, um, you, with sharing with you some, some of these early results, um, th this is how we ran the protocol. Patients were actually pre-treated with acetazolamide, that's a weak diuretic, uh, in order to prevent altitude sickness. Um, they were exposed to um, 10 sessions over um, uh, 22 days, where each session was around four hours, and that was based upon prior data that suggested that um, uh, the changes of acclimatization could be induced with, um, with this type of approach. Um, we gradually acclimatized them um, in session one through four to 2,700 meters, and that's roughly one and three quarter times the, um, the height of, uh, of Denver. And then the remaining sessions, they stayed at 2,700 meters. Uh, this protocol was carried out in um, collaboration with the Food and Drugs Administration, who had to approve the protocol um, since we were using a, a device. And here are some early results. So again, we'll be sharing these at the American Heart Association in a couple of days. Um, so patients who sat in the, in the tent when they reached peak altitude has had a significant reduction in oxygen saturation. Um, and um, uh, um, consequently, we saw an increase in red blood cell mass that was not only present immediately after the altitude protocol, but was actually sustained one month after they had uh, discontinued the altitude sessions. Again, this is uh, data on um, a small sample of patients um, and certainly um, just hypothesis generating. Intriguingly, um, these patients had improvement in every measure of exercise performance that we tested. Um, peak oxygen consumption is the measure most commonly used to evaluate cardiac patients uh, for exercise performance. Um, there was a significant improvement in peak oxygen consumption that appeared to be sustained again one month after we stopped uh, training them for altitude. Um, and again, um, improvements in, in six-minute walk, um, uh, um, a commonly used evaluation for heart failure patients. So I'm going to close by showing you this picture here. And when I, I heard some groaning from the audience, uh, and perhaps uh, if I were ever invited to speak again at this symposium, this will be the heart failure patient that I'll show you as we continue to look at uh, um, novel ways to improve the quality of, our, uh, of life of our patients. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.
Are there any questions? Do you want me to move that? Is that bothering everyone? <laughs> <laughs> Post LVAD treatment where there's regeneration uh, of function, is there any information yet that the old myocardial cells are becoming stronger or perhaps you generated new myocardial cells? Um, we have no data that there is new cell uh, generation. And you know that there's a lot of work in heart failure at the bench uh, looking at um, uh, um, st stem cells and stem cell recruitment in uh, myocardial injury. Um, the um, thought is that this is improvement in function of the existing, um, um, the existing myocytes. And importantly, perhaps a change in the um, connective tissue um, architecture. Um, but no, not, not a lot of, in, um, of inf information. Well, um, I will say that every single parameter that is manifest in advanced heart failure, um, whether it's electrical remodeling, um, apoptosis, and Dr. Kitsis is here in the, in the audience who is really a leader in that field, uh, seems to improve after a prolonged uh, um, uh, period of mechanical circuitry support. Uh, Simon, thank you for a wonderful overview bringing me up to date with uh, what's going on. There is a rich literature, though, in terms of reversibility or recovery of heart muscle cells that have been exposed to overload. Uh, this is all in experimental animals. So it's perfectly logical that uh, these cells do respond and do recover. And as I recall, there's some studies on sarcoplasmic reticulum in reversal that are in the cells that do recover after LVAD. That's correct. That's correct, Secretary. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this lovely lecture. The question pertains to recovery of function in heart failure secondary to the LVAD implementation. Uh, the question is actually in two parts. The first part is where have the best results been seen uh, when it comes to recovery of function? Is it in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or in dilated cardiomyopathy? And which kind of etiology we're talking about, ischemic or non-ischemic? And the second part pertains to if it, uh, within the ischemic part, are we, uh, how soon after the injury should the LVAD be implemented? And is there any impact on the duration of treatment? Well, that's an excellent question. And I, I'm sorry I didn't address that. Um, so it is um, uniformly recognized, and again, you can imagine there aren't very large data sets on this patient population, that individuals who have chronic, long-standing ischemic injury with scar related to prior infarction are generally not candidates for this approach. The patients who are candidates for this approach are patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, and actually we, we don't offer LVADs to individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy since their left ventricular function is essentially normal until very late stages in the disease. One um, patient's, uh, one area of, of uh, particular applicability of this strategy is in individuals who have previously virgin hearts who come in with a massive myocardial infarction. Um, can then be supported um, by short-term circuitry support with a very high rate um, of uh, recovery with concomitant medical therapy and removal of the device. And that is now more and more utilized both here and at other large, uh, um, uh, large programs. Um, so acute infarction, chronic non-ischemic uh, um, uh, heart failure, these are the, uh, um, the primary patient populations. Let me ask one question, which is before this talk, how many people in the room knew about this research activity at Monty? You've done your job. 